Uh, just a couple of follow-ups in the first session. If you want to bring a soil sample, we ask you to bring it in a one-inch PVC pipe. If you need some, we have these available for you to take and just bring back with us, uh, to us. Bring more than one. Be sure and label the pipe from the area you took it, front yard, backyard, side yard, tree, shrub, whatever. But uh, this enables you to bring the soil sample, and it means it's easy for us to get out, plus we have an adequate amount of soil. Um, if you find you have to use a sledgehammer to pound this in the ground, that's a clue that you need a little more water. Oh, so, a lot of rocks. Pardon? Is that what that means? That's Can be, yeah, it's a type of, yeah. But you play, get this in there. There are ways, there are the things to do that you can help penetrate. If the water's too hard, uh, water, put down some aqueduct, which is soil penetrant water, let that water go down, keep going down with it. But you gotta be able to get it in six or seven inches. Um, this is the earth auger, the soil auger that we sell. Uh, we have a 24 inch, which is this, it takes a 3 8 inch chuck. Uh, a cordless drill will turn this if it's 14 volts or more. A 9 volt won't, doesn't have enough juice to turn it. The 18 inch is a little smaller, uses a quarter inch chuck. We also take a uh, hard face these for eight dollars more. We put a, a hard face material on this so it's gonna last about three times as long. If you have rocky soil or a lot of things to do, it's worth the extra investment. We also take these, well, two of them together so that you can stand and drill a 24 inch deep hole without breaking your back, which is easy to do. But uh, this is what we suggest, about a one and seven eighth inch diameter hole. Makes it nice, it's not too big, not too small. Uh, but that's what so you get your holes with. Okay, anybody have any questions, thought about while you were on break? Yes, sir. You're talking about Epsom salts for roses. I thought salt was bad. Okay, Epsom salts for roses. Salt is bad, okay. Back up a little bit. A salt, the basic definition of a salt is anything that's a residual of an acid-base reaction. For instance, magnesium sulfate would be a reaction between magnesium hydroxide and sulfuric acid. Uh, the, the acid and the base would combine to make water, then you'd have magnesium sulfate left over. That's the basic definition of a salt. When you and I think of salt, we think of table salt. We think of chloride salts. So yes, chloride salts are bad. Epsom salts is good. There's no chlorine in. There's no chloride in there. It's good clarification. Good clarification. So, generally, you know, salts. We talk about salts. We think of table salt. Sodium chloride is table salt. Potassium chloride, muriate of potash. Those are all bad type of salts. But in general, salts are just anything left over between an acid-base reaction. So, don't take my salt and stuff. No, no, that's sodium chloride. No way. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh -huh. If you want to get rid of it, put your salt in there. Yes? Well, generally when you make the hole, we suggest you fill with pea gravel for the lawn application and then let the pea gravel stop just below your root zone. Because the idea you want to do, you want the moisture and the air to go down there and, and then percolate out around that. And one hole can aerate and uh, hydrate a approximately one inch diameter circle. So you don't have to put that PVC in? No, if you put the PVC in, you, you really defeat the purpose of it, because then the water only goes out the bottom instead of going out the side. If you, if I, I, I don't know if you're talking about doing a tree, but like a tree, you want it to go further down to get the yes. further down so that you can get in some where you would use PVC to pipe it? Yes. Okay, if you're doing a tree, would that be an instance where you do a PVC pipe? Yes and no. Okay, the reason that uh, general fertilization of trees, let's say, there's a handout in there talking about fertilization of trees. At the, at the drip line of the tree, which is your outer branches straight down, you drill holes. They alternate between fertilizer and gravel. Fertilizer holes are 12 inches deep, filled to within four inches of the top with fertilizer, soil on top. The next hole is gravel, 24 inches deep, filled with pea gravel. That, when you water, that allows the moisture to percolate down, bring oxygen in behind it. You get that 50-50 soil pour ratio we saw up there earlier. Now, the benefit or the use of a solid pipe is when you want to go below the root zone and you want to inject the water closer to the base of the tree. Uh, 
far? Do you want to water further down so the roots can start going further down? Does that sound? Roots will follow water and nutrients, but generally most of your tree roots are on the top 6 to 12 inches of ground because that's where your top soil is. There's no nutrients below that. You know, you go to that horizon layer, so A, B, C, horizon. You get to B, horizon, there's no nutrients. They'll, they'll stay where the nutrients are. Now, some trees have a tap root. That root just goes straight down. That anchors the tree. Have you ever been up to, like, in the mountains? We go to Yosemite. It's our favorite place to go. But there are trees growing out of the side of mountains. Well, they got a tap root that goes straight down. Now, I don't know how they do that. They get their nutrients in water, but there's a tap root. But the surface feeding roots are where they get their nutrients. Okay, good question. Anything else? Yes, sir. Oh, a square foot. Yeah, like six inch diameter on either side be a one square foot diameter area that you can hydrate and aerate with a with a hole. Okay, questions. Good. Uh, first half, review a little bit. We dealt with abiotic problems in the landscape, things that have nothing to do with living agents, things that can cause your plant not to do optimally. We talked about water air deficiencies. We talked about uh, wind and sun, drying things out, burning things. We talked about compaction pruning. We talked about the soil environment. Within the soil environment, you have three factors. You have the soil type, you have soil pH, and you have the nutrients. We dealt with those issues. We know what the three numbers on a fertilizer bag are, what they do, how they help the plant. Um, So once you get to that point, if things are still not right, we adjust our screen here. It's like me, I get shorter with old age. It's slipping down here. Anyway. Uh, we're going to deal with the second part of the series, which is going to deal with biotic problems in the landscape. Things that actually have to do with living agents that are invading, keeping you from having an optimum environment for the plants to grow in. Uh, we're going to deal with weeds. Basically, weed is a plant out of place. Insects. Fungi, snails, slugs, rodents, and then we'll deal with application equipment. Format the second part will be about the same. We'll go to a certain point. We'll take a break, stretch break. We'll come back and then finish out. That's kind of where we're headed. Things deal with living things that affect your landscape. Okay, we're going to do weeds or plants out of place. My daughter did some of these things when you're playing with it. I don't know how to do that kind of thing with PowerPoint. But anyway, a plant out of place. This is the backyard of my house. Um, got a patio overhang about six inches. Uh, that faces north. The sun in the summertime, I've got about a two-fit strip here where there's no sun. Then, of course, the sun goes south in the wintertime. That goes out. But this lack of turf. Along the edge there, when there's lack of turf, you get weeds. So I weeds, plants out of place. My yard's Bermuda. I do not overseed my yard in the wintertime. I know. <laughs> Gardener Supply employee, and I don't do that. No, I don't do that. I know. Shame, shame for me. I should get fired. I need a rest. I need a rest. <laughs> I need a rest. <laughs> we hope to, uh, two and a half years, we hope to move to, to Wyoming. I told my wife, I'm not buying a lawnmower. I don't care. Yes, Sundance. Are you oh, familiar? Who are you? Are you familiar with anything? Oh yeah, we lived in Wyoming. Oh, what part? Uh, Evanston. Evanston. That's down in the southwest corner, right? Yeah. You know yeah. what snows up there? Right? Yeah. A lot. Huh? <laughs> not, not, not like New York. Not like that. It's cold. 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 It's cold. It's cold. Actually, you know, if you, I'll take a digression, but if you look at a map, Sundance is the northeastern corner. If the Sunset Magazine will divide the state in half, this, this the southern half, western half is is more severe weather than the other side. Well, I've got um, three cities on my channel, weather channel. I got Sundance, Wyoming. I have Rapid, I have Laramie, Wyoming, where our son's going to school, University of Wyoming, when he's not overseas with. He's in Kuwait right now. One of our sons is in Kuwait right now, and the other one, our youngest daughter, is going to University of Montana, Bozeman. And so I go Bozeman, Sundance, and Laramie. And 19 out of 20 times, Sundance is the warmest. Like today, we were 18, Laramie was 1, and Bozeman was minus 7. That's relative, but it's warm. <laughs> well, we've we lived in Texas, so I want some place for the seasons. I want to rest. Anyway, I don't overseed my lawn. Um, but you get a weed, and that, that just looks terrible. You know, it's a weed out, it's a final place. It should be all nice and brown. 
I got some up there on the other corner. It should be all nice and brown. That's a plant out of place. A rose bush in the middle of a hayfield is a weed. It's a plant out of place. It's not supposed to be there. It's a weed. So a weed is a plant out of place. We want to know how to take care of these things. So we need to look at what kind of plants they are. A weed is basically one of three types. You can have a broadleaf weed or what's called a dicot. A dicot means stands for dicotyledon, the first leaves out of the seed. There's two of them. It's a dicot. That's a broadleaf weed. You look at the leaf, and the veins in the leaf are perpendicular to the main rib. If you take a weed leaf, it'll have a main rib down the middle, and then there'll be branches coming off that. That's going to be a broadleaf weed. This distinction is going to be very important, especially when we get to how to control them or prevent them in a landscape. There's grasses or monocot. Mono meaning one. A grass seed only has one shoot coming out of the seed. It's a monocot. The veins in the leaf are parallel to one another. Example, poa, poa annua, fox crabgrass, foxtail, and Bermuda grass. Bermuda grass is a weed. I don't care what you use it for turf grass, it's a weed. I grew up in San Diego and spent many weekends digging devil grass out of flower beds and shrubs. So when I come up here to Bakersfield, you do what for a lawn? Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a grass. Uh, Broadleaves, dandelion, clover, wild carrot, spurge. Then you have sedges. A sedge has a triangular stem and a distinctive midrib. Example, nut sedge or green kalinga. So knowing what kind of weed we have helps us understand how to control it or prevent it. And there's those three types of weeds. Weeds are also classified by annual, perennial, or biennial. An annual plant germinates, grows, puts out a seed, and dies within one year. A perennial plant is exists year after year. Grows, seeds out, grows, seeds out, grows, seeds out, maintains year after year after year. It's a perennial plant. Biennial means it takes two years to complete its life cycle. Wild carrot is an example of a biennial plant. You can also have seasonal, fall, winter, etc., now, the reason for this is it's key in how to control them or prevent them, knowing what kind of weed we have. For instance, you classify weeds so you can know how to prevent and control. For instance, spurge is a summer annual broadleaf weed. Okay, summer annual broadleaf. It germinates when it's hot, summer. It's an annual plant. Its life cycle is one year, and it's a broadleaf. So... If it germinates in the summer, it's in our area, germ around, germinates around May. Would you put down a pre-emergent now to prevent spurge? Not quite. No, not quite yet. Any label will say you put down a pre-emergent. We'll look at pre-emergents in a minute. But you put it down two to three weeks before the emergence of the target wheat. So, spurge is not going to germinate for another four months. So why would I buy spurge preventer and put it down now? I wouldn't. Crabgrass is a spring annual grassy weed. Oh, boy. Spring wheat is going to germinate in spring. When soil temperatures hit 55 to 57 degrees for 10 days in a row, crabgrass germinates. In our area, that's usually around the middle of February, first part of March. So if it, on average it germinates mid-February, and you want to put your pre-emergent down two to three weeks before the emergence of the target weed, you would be back to what? The last week of January. So what are we doing right now? We're putting down pre-emergent to prevent crabgrass. Now, okay. Poa annual is a winter annual grassy weed. Right? Poa annual generally, winter generation in winter. So I want to put my pre emergent down sometime in the fall to prevent poa. Uh, I think you have a sample here. Poa annual is it's a little clump grass, a little grassy, lighter green than your lawn, puts a little white seed out on the top of it. Pretty prevalent. Um, this is just an aside, but the, the poa seed is one of the highest allergenic things in the air. If you look at the, the, the seed under a microscope, it's a lot of sharp edges on it. But you know what? It's full of poa in, in schoolyards. But the schools won't let you put down a pre-emergent to prevent poa because it's a chemical we don't want chemicals around, so we'll let the kids have POA and have all kinds of allergies for an allergen anyway. Figure that one out. Wild carrot is a winter biennial broadleaf weed. Dandelion is a perennial broadleaf weed. Dandelion can germinate any time of the year. 
So knowing what kind of weed we have and what, what time, when we're trying to prevent it tells us how to manage our pre-emergent program. Okay, typical scenario. Someone comes to Gardener Supply and needs something to kill my weeds. Our customers are trained. Our, our staff is trained. <laughs> customers are trained to do that too. Uh, what kind of weeds do you have and where are they? Okay, that, that's basic information we know to help you. What kind of weeds do you have and where are they? Is it a broadleaf or a grass? Well, I don't know. Uh, well, we help describe a little bit. Uh, is it in your lawn, flower bed, or shrub area? Well, it's in my lawn. Okay. You know, so we, we try to get as much information as we can to help you as best we can. So that's standard. You know, I need something to kill my weeds. What are they and where are they? So to do that, we need to deal with herbicides. Herbicides is one branch of a thing called pesticide. A pesticide is anything that mitigates or does something to a pest. When you're dealing with weeds, plants are pests. So herb, herb is a name for plants, so it's a herbicide, is that category of pesticide that has to do with plant control. So we deal with herbicides, products that affect plants in some way. If we're going to control insects, what do we use? We use an insecticide. We want to treat a fungus, we do a what? A fungicide. We want to treat rodents, we use a rodenticide. So, you know, it's all pretty easy. Okay. You want to get rid of your neighbor, use a neighboricide. <laughs> Oh, we're out of stock. We're out of stock. Actually, we got a little card up front that, that says that on it, but we're out of stock right now. It's been, it's been back ordered for several years. Okay, a pre-emergent, uh, it kills weed seeds as they germinate. Well, the best defense is a good offense. You put out a pre-emergent, it's a chemical barrier in the soil, and it kills a seed as it germinates. So most of your pre-emergence will kill the root out of the seed. In other words, when that seed germinates, the root comes out and it, it, it encounters this chemical. It stops that root from growing. And if the root doesn't grow, then there's no plant. So some of those are surfland, pendimethalin, dimension, uh, treflan, bayland. Those are some of their trade names that deal with that. There are pre-emergents that kill the first leaf out. In other words, here's your seed. Uh, your root starts out, starts to grow, puts up a, a, a leaf, and then there's a chemical barrier there. That, that leaf hits it and the, it dies. Most products call Ronstar. Now, how does that help? Can it help me? Well, if you want to sprig Bermuda grass, you can hybrid Bermuda, you want to put a hybrid Bermuda on, you put down sprigs. You can put down Ronstar as a pre-emergent when you do that. Because the sprigs have leaves already established and it doesn't affect the roots. So you can put down a pre-emergent with your sprigs and not have a problem. Ron Star's fairly expensive, but knowing how they work can help you do it. There are up to six different modes of action for pre-emergents. Where's my book? Oh, something else. There they, no, that's not little No, it's a packet I had. Mm -hmm. I brought it over specifically to do this. I don't know what they're doing. Is that one of the six modes? Find the book? That is one of them. That's the that's the most important mode. What did I do? Well, I thought I had it up here. Oh here it is, right? <laughs> so don't try this at home, please. please. Okay, one of the things we do here, I, I have what's called a QAL. My name is Randy Durkus, by the way. Uh, I'm the store manager. I actually started here January 1993. I've been here 17 years. It starts my 18th year. Um, I have a QAL, Qualified Applicator License, allows me to apply pesticides for hire. There are different levels of qualifications. The QAC, Qualified Applicator Certificates, allows a maintenance gardener to apply pesticides in relation to, in conjunction with his regular maintenance garden. In other words, he had to mow before he can do that. A qualified applicator license, I don't have to do any maintenance. I can come in and you can hire me to, to put down pesticides. It's a minimum that the state of California requires for us to be a pesticide dealer. 
You know, when you buy a sledgehammer, you have to have a little piece of paper. You have to be a pesticide dealer to sell sledgehammer. You can't buy that at Lowe's, Home Depot, Kmart, Walmart. Um, but that's the minimum requirement we have. But to maintain that license, I have to take 20 hours of continuing education every year to maintain that license. One of the things I've done in the past is I, I try to pick out seminars that have manufacturers' representatives speak, because that's what we want to deal with. Uh, this is a book put out by BASF, one of the chemical companies. This is a listing here of pre-emergent herbicides. List all the different ones available in the field today and their mode of action. So in other words, you Ronstar attacks the leaf, surfline and pentamethylene dimension kill the roots. Some of these others work in different ways. So if a problem, a person would have a problem, say, oh, well, I, I use this product and I'm not getting weed control, you can say, well, let's go to a different pre-emergent that has a different mode of action. So there's different things we can do. But modes of action, um, kill roots, kill leaf, are the, are the most, most usual ones that we have. Yes. Which leaves four others? What are they? I could read them, but they, I don't know if you'd understand them. Just a moment. Okay. Can we go for an immunity to this thing? You can inhibit the acetyl COA carboxylate, inhibit inhibit inhibition of acetylate synthesis ALS, microtube assembly inhibition, inhibition of photosynthesis at photosystem two, inhibition of EEPSP synthase. <laughs> And there's a there's a test after that. So you know, they they know it. I don't. I just know it. Kills the roots, kills the leaf. Uh, okay, each pre-emergent has a range or spectrum of control. In other words, let's say here's your weeds, grassy to broadleaf, A to Z, everything in between. Well, a pre-emergent may have this spectrum of control, or may kill these, may control these grasses and these broadleaf, uh, but not the annual broadleaf, perennial broadleaf. So each pre-emergent has a different spectrum of control. The pre-emergent we're suggesting now, pendimethylin, which is in the 20-5-10 plus preem, is an excellent pre-emergent for grassy weeds. But what are you trying to prevent right now? We're trying to prevent crabgrass. So we put down that. Spurge germinates in May. So in April, we're going to suggest an application of a different pre-emergent that works on broadleaf weeds. That product is called gallery or portrait. You put that down in April because spurge terminates in the summer. Portrait works on broadleaf weeds, does not work on grassy weeds. So someone can come in here and they say, you know, I used your pre-emergent and our lawn's still full of weeds. I say, well, what pre-emergent did you use? Yada, yada, yada. Okay, I bet you the weeds in your lawn are broadleaf weeds, like dandelion or clover. And they'll look at me like, how do you know that? Mm -hmm. Well, you put down a pre-emergent for grassy weeds, do you have grassy weeds? No. Pre-emergent did good. So now they're not mad at me anymore. <laughs> but uh, for optimum control, two, mer two materials must be used. If you want to control the majority of the spectrum, you're going to need at least to use two different active ingredients. Yes, sir? So if you have two different varieties of grass, two whole muta and a fescue, hmm? can you use the same? Okay, question is, if you have two different types of grasses like Bermuda and fescue, can we use the same ones? Yes, qualified. And the reason I say that because there are, on that other slide, we had uh, pendimethylin, surflan, bayon. Surflan does root printing. Surflan is okay to use on a Bermuda lawn, but you would not want to use it on a fescue lawn because it, it reduces root mass by three-fourths. So, again, we will sell you. If we have something different, we will ask you what kind of lawn do you have. We will want to make sure we get the right thing. But the way it goes now, uh, the pendimethylin and gallery, grassy weed, broadleaf, safe to use on any and all lawns. No problem with that. Good question. Okay, to be effective, um, you set up your control zone. Pre-emergence set up in that top inch of soil. They're fairly insoluble materials. When you water them in, they don't travel very far in the soil. They'll stay within that top inch. When you put down a pre-emergent, it must be watered in with at least half inch of water to move it into that soil profile. Uh, it'll take two weeks, up to two weeks, to incorporate and activate. So I had to put it down two weeks before the emergence of the target weed. And multiple applications are better than one heavy one. Now the reason for that is some of your, your labels will say, you can put this down, say, let's say you're using a liquid spray, and it'll say you can use two ounces per 
thousand square feet, or you can take one ounce per thousand, and three months later do one ounce per thousand. We would suggest you do the split applications. And you're going to say, well, isn't that twice as much work? Yes, it is. But the problem is, notice here it says, tips, first germinates, your barrier is gone. What happens when that pre-emergence sets up in the soil? It's there. Several so weeks go by, sun hits it, water it, walk on it. The pre-emergent barrier begins to degrade where? At the top. This is where you need it, especially for spurs. So I would rather put down one light application now, three months later put another one down so I can maintain my layer, my pre-emergent berry at the top of that soil rather than a heavy one here and five months later have nothing in the top eighth inch of the soil. And then I'm overrun with spurge. Yes, sir? Is this application for both grass and fire that yes. touches the surface? Yes, the yes, yes. That's where your weed seeds are. Is, is, is the application the same for flower beds and lawns? Yes, it is. Yes. So, check the label, make sure the weed you want to prevent is listed on it. Again, we will, we know what they are, we'll know what to do, ask or check the label. Um, I got a big thick blue book. Uh, if we need to look up a specific weed and see what works on it, we can do that. But your, this is your control zone, it's that top inch of soil. That, that's the barrier you want to maintain. And uh, like one, one speaker said, if spurs starts to germinate, spurs germinates on top of the ground. So if spurge starts germinating, you know that top 16th inch is, is gone. So maintain your pre-emergent barrier. Enemies of pre-emergence, what can cause them not to work well? Well, volatilization, uh, that simply means it, it goes up in the atmosphere. Some materials are more volatile than others. Um, Treff land, for instance, if you put it down, you need to be watered in immediately. If it does no water within a week, most of it's gone. Pentamethylene can sit on top of the ground for up to 30 days before it's watered in. So it depends on what, but general application, when you put it down, start your watering right away. Absorption, chemically bonds to soil organic material. Uh, let's say you're going to spray surfland, weed and peed product from Monterey, it's an orange stuff, and you've got uh, redwood chips on your, on your flower bed, and you're spraying, oh, they want to prevent weeds. So that surfland binds to that redwood chip, it never gets down to the soil. So if you're in a situation like that, use a granular product. Granules will fall down and then water it in. Uh, water solubility, does it leach too far in the soil? Usually that's not a problem with pre-emergence. Uh, stability on soil surface, how long does it last before degradation due to sunlight, water, etc.? So general rule of thumb, as soon as you put your pre-emergence in, as soon as you can can. That's general rule of thumb for the best results. Yes, sir? You just have to water at that one time? You need a half inch of water. Just well, it could be one time, or it could be several applications cumulative. Yeah, and water. that that's a, that's a problem with drippers because you have to move it through the soil. But that dripper sometimes, if uh, the labels will say don't put a pre-emergent on standing water, if you try the, the 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 chemical nature of it, it repels each other, and you'll find it all around the edge of the puddle. Uh, but generally, we put them down there, your drippers, or if you have that situation, uh, just move a hose with a little owl sprinkler on and, and get the overhead watering for, for a while. But move it in the soil zone. Any other questions? Okay, second category, pre-emergent, pre, meaning before. Well, what happens if I didn't get my pre-emergent down or it's a weed that that pre-emergent barrier doesn't affect? Well, then I have to move to what's called a post-emergent. And post-emergence will kill weed seeds after they've emerged. So I got this weed in my backyard. Remember the picture of my backyard? I got those weeds there. I need to go out and kill them. So how am I going to do it? Well, I can have a systemic pre-emergent or a contact pre-emergent. Anybody have any idea what those are? So this is all post-emergence. Oh, okay, post. Okay, systemic material is absorbed in a plant, goes down to the root, and the other... Contact the leaf. Anything that comes in contact with it is going to burn. Just psst. I caught I wrote my the red bottle over there. Good stuff. You have selective versus non-selective. What do you think we mean there? Kills certain things and it kills Okay. Selective means it kills some things and not other things. Non-selective means it's going to kill everything. Again, you have up to eight different modes of action. Jan, do you want to know what they are? <laughs> well, Bonnie, you want to know what they are? Okay. I can't even pronounce those probably. Again, you know, here, here's, an, here's an issue, too, of liquid versus granule. Um, because pre-emergence are inhibitors, 
your, your, let's go back to premer just for a minute. I just thought about this with the modes of action. If you have a flower bed, flowering plants, your safest to use is a granule. Because if you spray, that pre-emergent can affect your buds because it has that fact. So the best thing in a flower bed is a granular material. Yes, sir. The granule would be your best bang for the buck, so to say. In general, granulars are more convenient. Liquids are more cost-effective. Granules are more convenient. Put in a spreader, spread it out there, you're done. Spray, you spray, you got to clean out the sprayer, but it is cheaper. Um, so generally, granules are, are more convenient. The liquids are more cost effective in, in, in general. Are they harmful to animals? Are they handful of animals? Yeah, Applied according to the label, no. And general labels will say, uh, for instance, a, a pre emergent, once it's down and watered and dried, it's safe. Post emergence, once it dries, it's safe. No problem. Okay. Um, we're going to use these things, systemic versus context, selective versus non-selective, for several things. Systemic herbicides enters at the plant, the leaves, stems, and travel to the root, source to sink. They work slowly, especially in cool weather, will kill annual as well as perennial plants. Now, the Roundup work this time of year? Yes. It may take three weeks before you see the results, but it'll work because plants are growing slower. But they'll still work. Still work. Uh, yes. Okay, contact herbicides kills only the tissue it contacts, does not translocate to the root, kills annual weeds only, kills quickly even in cold weather. An annual weed, if you kill the top leaves, it's going to die. A perennial plant, you can burn the top leaves, but it's going to come back from the roots. So that's why your contacts are for annual weeds only. Kills quickly even in cold weather. <clears throat> this is a weed I had in my garden area one time. Somebody asked me a couple years ago, what kind of weed is that? And I said, well, and that kind of caught me because it's a dandelion, but I wasn't used to having dandelions in non-grassy areas. So I, I probably got graded down for that one. But that's a dandelion. No, it's a sunny day. Um, I sprayed this with diquat dibromide, which is the same active ingredient in the red bottle that we sell the next day, grass and weed killer. That's 24 hours later. Yippee! Yippee, yeah, yeah. Even after the fog came in, it's foggy this day, but that's 24 hours later. What's it called? It's called, uh, which one? That weed? That's a dandelion. <laughs> it's next day grass and weed killer. What's the red bottle? Sad story to tell on that. Several years ago, we thought we were going to lose it. The company didn't register in California. We told everybody. I had a guy come in the other day, and he bought a case of it. And then he said, now you tell me it's back on the market again. I know what, we just got to do what we got to do. They actually had a big company, big enough to re-level, relabel the registration. We got three pallets of it. I uh, went to reorder this year. The company is no longer in business. So now I really, truly swear, across my heart, hope to die, that it, once it's gone, it's gone. <laughs> well, the problem with that is nobody wants to pick up the registration on it. Now, this is a little parenthesis, but products in, in federal EPA, Cal EPA, federal EPA will test a product, manufacture it, demonstrate, spends millions of dollars. <clears throat> it takes 150 to $260 million to bring a product to market. Testing, labeling, registration, all this stuff like that. So a company comes to California and said, you know, I, I'd have to spend $10 million more to meet California requirements. I only sell a million dollars of that stuff in the state, so why should I pay the money to do it? So we lose label registrations. Pardon? Twenty dollars and ninety-nine cents. It's a quart. It'll make four gallons of spray. So diquat dibromide is an excellent material. <clears throat> Nobody's going to pick it up because it's going to cost millions of dollars to register in the state of California. So what we're losing, we're losing contact herbicides. At this point, other than the next day, there's only one contact herbicide available, and that's the Monterey product called Herbicide Helper. That's the only other contact material that I know of that's registered in the state of California. But yeah. Roundup again is is non-selective. Contact non-selective. Roundup will go to the roots. The contacts don't, but the contacts work faster. So, for instance, uh, you know, if you had a flower bed, say you wanted to, you know, you got company coming this weekend, it's, you know, a couple days later they're all brown. It, it's just an easy, quick, knockdown material. It's good. Uh, that's what you use in a dormer Bermuda lawn that has poe annu in it. 
Uh, you don't want to spray Roundup on the Bermuda because it may go down and affect the roots, but you can kill the weeds, just burn them down. Just turn everything brown. So. Go ahead. Can I go in from Nevada? Exactly. <laughs> I can't answer that. <laughs> Let your conscience be your guide, yeah. Can you use wild carrot in your dormant yeast? You can use it, but wild carrot is not an annual weed. It's a biennial. It's going to come back. Good, can good, they, good can question. Can you to buy this stuff someplace else and bring it over the border, or is that that's illegal? Less than five that's gallons. Illegal? Technically, that's illegal. Five so buy less than a gallon. I don't know. But. No, you know, another thing is, one of them on this topic, we've got a product over there. We deal with self store, soil sterilants in a minute. The only thing you can buy as a homeowner is one gallon of Promoton. That's a two point something percent active ingredient. A gallon does a thousand square feet. Cost you thirty bucks. I was going to be visiting my son a couple of years ago. Uh, well, our second son lives in Rapid City, South Dakota. The police officer there, and they have different the road. Then there's a sidewalk, and there's this, there's a strip in here where most people put rock down. They put plastic, put down rock. Over the years, the plastic cracks, weeds start growing up between us. I said, Scott, you need a soil sterile. I mean, let's go get you some soil sterile. So I went down to a place called Runnings, which is similar to Tractor Supply. Uh, go down the little aisle way. I saw what we have is five dollars cheaper because they don't have to pay all the registration stuff. And I said, "Now nah, they got some better than that." We're on the corner. I could buy a gallon of Promoton 25E, 25% active ingredient. A gallon does 25,000, does 10,000 square feet for 59.99. I picked it up. I looked around. <laughs> Left the cash register. I bought it. Walked out. Nobody said a hoot. Pay cash. Pay cash. <laughs> Credit card. Yeah, cash under the table. So you know, my idea is it's California. It's just it's so screwed up. You know why? You know what difference is there to there make? You know I, I don't know. That's California. But anyway, but anyway, there's there's things out that are better, faster, newer. Safer, yada, 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 but we'll never get them in California because it costs too much to register. So, anyway, this is contact. Uh, selective herbicides. Kill one type of plant and not the other. Examples of Trimec. Okay, you have a lawn. You have broadleaf weeds in your lawn. You can put Trimec down. It's selective. Kills some things, but not other. Why can it do that? Because remember the difference between a grass and a broadleaf. A dicot and a monocot. Selective. Grass getter. Grass getter will kill grass and not hurt the plants. You have Bermuda grass growing in your shrubs. You can spray that right over the top. Kills the grass. Doesn't hurt your selective. Could, could you spray that around an orange tree and still be safe to eat the oranges? Yeah. Can you spray that around an orange tree and still be safe to eat the oranges? Yeah. The label is the law. If the label allows you to do that around a citrus tree, then you can do it around a citrus tree. The other side of that is there's no scientific evidence that that ever enters the tree. Okay, uh, selective herbicide will always be systemic because it's a contact that kills everything. They have to be systemic. When you go down to the root, they'll, they'll kill the plant. Okay, non-selective herbicide kills everything it's applied to, can be contact or systemic. Non-selective means it doesn't, it just does everything. So, here's a test. How would you classify Roundup? It is a post-emergent, systemic, non-selective herbicide. Now, you want to impress your enemies and influence your friends? <laughs> Tell them what you learned today. I learned. Okay, quite. you don't want to put that on Bermuda grass? No, you do not. Now, well, the label allows you to spray Roundup on a dormant Bermuda lawn. The question of dormancy in Kern County. We would say it's safe to spray that on a Bermuda lawn that's had a hard frost for three days in a row. If, so, I did two years ago, I had no problem. I did yeah. half the tri and the... Yeah, again, you know, it, it, it's allowed to be put on a dormant Bermuda lawn. It just determines on whether the lawn is truly dormant yeah, at the time you do it. Mm-hmm. 
that was full of these little strange weeds. Right. And his lawn was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I did that, and I had chunks of where it didn't grow the next year. Right. It's, it's, the, timing is, the timing is critical. Uh, you know, I would suggest if you can do it some other way, do it some other way. Use Roundup as your last resort. Um, it's just a chance you take. But it can be done as long as it's dormant. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm oh, sorry. Wait a minute. Pardon? Okay. What about weed hoe? Weed hoe is MSMA active ingredient. It kills crabgrass, foxtail, Dallas grass, Johnson grass, goosegrass. Goosegrass and Dallas grass are perennial grassy weeds. You can use it on them right now. Crabgrass hasn't germinated yet. Foxtail hasn't germinated yet. So Monterey Weed Hoe MSMA, you can use it now if you're controlling Dallas grass or goose grass. It's the only thing on the label that's actively growing right now. Yes, sir? If you have pescue and you have some Bermuda growing into it, uh-huh. Okay. If you have fescue and you have some Bermuda invasion, how can you do it? There are selective materials called Turplon Ester. Kills the Bermuda grass and broadleaf weeds without hurting your fescue. Turflon ester. I might have some of it up here. But it's, it's a program. It's not a one-time shot. It's a program. Uh, but it, there is a material that you can kill your Bermuda grass out of your fescue line. Yeah. Okay, so you guys passed. Yay. Okay, surfactants. Uh, surfactant is short for surface active agent. It increases the surface area of contact of the herbicide. In other words, when you spray, that little droplet sits on the leaf like this. Like you have a waxed car and you hose it down, the little bud, the little bubble, bubble of water. Uh, surfactant makes that bubble flatten out. So your amount of surface area contacted by your herbicide is much greater. In certain concentrations, it'll actually propel, makes a thing called a CMC, it'll actually propel the herbicide through the leaf tissue. Now, if you're familiar, you've used sedgehammer before, that's why you have to use surfactant at a high rate to propel that through the waxy tissue. Uh, that actually moves the herbicide through the leaf surface. can be used with both selective and non-selective herbicides. Now, Roundup, uh, generic brands, name brands, already have surfactant added. Your classic Roundup, your generic Roundups like Monterey Muta have 7.5% surfactant by weight added already. Your professional like the Razor Pro 2.5 gallon jugs have 14% surfactant by weight. So do you need additional surfactant with those? Probably not. But most of your herbicides, it, it just nice thing to do. Uh, check with the label. Uh, sometimes they will say use a non-ionic or sometimes they'll use a MSO, methylated seed oil surfactants. Uh, the label will tell you if you need a specific surfactant to use. If it doesn't say a specific fact surfactant and you want to use it, just use a non-ionic one. It's generally safe to use. Randy? Yes? Let's follow up the last one. Why would a Bermuda grass commit to a fescue? I mean, why would the other Why does Bermuda grass go into fescue? Because Bermuda is more invasive. It spreads not only on top of ground, but underground. But the issue is, uh, back up a little bit, the issue is warm season, cool season grasses. Warm season grasses spread on top of ground and under the ground. Stolons and rhizomes. Cool season probably just sit there. So the advantage and disadvantage of eat, but they're more invasive. Yeah. Okay. Uh, demonstration. Here's why it's too much. It's somebody that's talented, ambidextrous, doesn't mind helping out. Somebody want to volunteer? This this isn't life for me. Okay. Okay, this is water, and what I need you to do is to hold. I don't want to get sued by having a wet floor. So I need to hold that in here. Sinus liability form. Yeah. Liability <laughs> release really, really, really waiver. Right okay, this is water. This is wax paper. Underneath this wax paper, the yellow strip is called a water sensitive paper. And I'm going to drip water down here. 
And what does it do on the wax paper? Runs off. It beads up, runs off. Can you all see that okay? Can we go back there? Perfect. Okay, let's go back there. Let's get it right there. Okay, now I've mixed some water with N90 and the non-ionic surfactant. We'll put it on the other side here. Now, do you see the difference? not running off like it did the other well, it takes longer. It's not running off. But if I keep this up long enough, it will penetrate that wax paper. And it'll start to turn blue on me. This is good yesterday, right? Did you mix it? Yeah. That'd be a form of water warning. <laughs> 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 That's I can't resist. Oh, no, no, I wouldn't get this. It's not like that. Um, Okay, so what happens with the non ion of the step back is it starts to bleed through the last paper. It's going to bleed through the last paper now. Okay, oh, the advantage of surfactant is the ability to help penetrate leaf tissue. Thank you. Especially if you're using a systemic or even a contact material. Or you want to get the material in the leaf and kill something. So generally, surfactant you want to use when you use post-emergent herbicides. Question? Yes, sir. If you were using sledgehammer, for example, and you need to use the N90 with it, mm -hmm. and you went a little heavy with the N90, does that hurt anything else, or do you just waste some money? Or? Question is, if you use the surfactant with sledgehammer, the N90 is two teaspoons per gallon. Does it hurt if you go heavier? There's no really back draw to it. It's just two teaspoons is enough. But, it, you know, there's no... If you go like four or six, there's not going to be a, a negative effect on the other end. There's, you can't be counterproductive with it. But two teaspoons is usually enough to do the job. Especially like, for example, using a 90 with sedgehammer. But it's good to use it with any herbicide, especially Trimac Plus. Trimac is an oily base already. It's a liquid oil. The Trimec Plus is what's called emulsifiable concentrate. and it We would suggest using N90 with Trimec Plus. It's not the oil base like the Trimec is. Uh, so the N90 then just breaks down the water molecules and lets them be absorbed? Yes. It, it reduces cohesion of the water and actually forms a CMC critical micelle complex that actually helps penetrate that through the thing. Breaks down the cohesion of the water. allows it to penetrate. Okay, well, the quality and herbicide performance. How many of you heard about our ongoing drought in California? Yeah. How many of you heard about pumping the aquifers dry and the, 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 the subsidence is coming down? Um, a corollary to that is water hardness. Because a lot of the water is being used, the, the water coming out is, is harder than the initial water coming out of the ground. It hasn't been replenished by the water ground percolation that we usually have. It's harder water. We've noticed that at my house, we live out in the country, we're on a well. Uh, my wife has had to go to using water softeners in the laundry when we did laundry. We're noticing that at, at our own house. Um, it's critical as, as water becomes harder, that means there's more positive ions in the solution. That means it's going to tie up chemically any herbicides you put in there, especially Trimec or Roundup. So if you live in a country, and you spray Trimex, spray Roundup, and it doesn't work. If you live in city, if our water quality continues to decline, becomes harder, we'll have problems using herbicides. The chemical you want to spray is tied up chemically in the water. If it becomes an issue, we do have a little hardness stick. We suggest you test your water. 
If your water comes up on the orange side or brown side, your water is hard and should be conditioned. There's a product I have called Quest. This is a water conditioning agent. You put this in the water first before you put your herbicide in. This ties up the hard minerals in the water that keeps your herbicide from acting effectively. So I'll just bring it up. We have a few issues, especially people in the rural areas. I might have to start using it myself. Usually city's not bad. But if, if you find your herbicides aren't working like they used to, it could be water quality issues. You want to check it. Yes, sir. Is that concentrate form? Yes, this is concentrate like form. Like water. No, it's not like using distilled. Is this concentrate? Yes, it's concentrate. It's like two teaspoons, two tablespoons per gallon or something like that. Uh, quartz and gallons. But anyway, it's an issue uh, that we have to look at and just keep you informed on things. Okay, soil sterilants. This is the next step above pre-emergent. It actually kills, prevents any plants from growing, anything. Uh, it's acts in soil to prevent any vegetative growth. can last up to a year. Uh, beware of using around existing vegetation. If you have a tree over here and five feet away you got a gravel bed you want to put down soil sterilant, I would not advise it because the tree roots can be over there. Soil sterilants are more soluble than a pre-emergent. They will leach slower than one inch because they're designed to kill anything in there. So it would, it would it would harm your vegetation, but it is a good thing to use. RV parking lots, alleyways, trash can areas, someplace we don't want anything to grow that's far away from other things. Uh, if you're concerned about damage in an area from a soil sterilant and you really want to keep something out as far as pre-emergent, many of your pre-emergents have what's called a non-crop rate which is heavier than what you would use on your lawn or flower bed. It gives you that extra protection of a heavier dose of material. So check the label if you want to use it. Okay. Well, before we do this next session, let's take another stretch break. Anybody's been sitting here kind of get yourself a drink, a cup of cookie, coffee. Take five minutes, just a few minutes. Okay, while, they're, while we're gathering back around, there were a couple questions that were asked. I'll uh, wait till they get back in here. Um, bottom pre emergence, post emergence. This is a pre emergence, a granular material, active ingredient, pentamethylin. 005, no nitrogen, no phosphorus, 5% potassium sulfate. This is used in flower beds, lawns, driveways, shrub areas, you name it. This is a good pre emergent to use. Granular. This is um, this is the next day grass and weed killer. This is your diquat dibromide, your contact material. Trimec, broadleaf weed killer, doesn't hurt the grasses, selective systemic. And then we got, um, this is weed and peat. This is liquid surfland. Uh, it's orange material. I mean, when this thing first came out, surfland and roundup first came out, we're living in Big Spring, Texas, and I thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread and indoor plumbing. It was great. But that's your surf land. This is also available in granular form. This is your Remuda. Remuda is a generic Roundup. The active ingredient in Roundup is glyphosate. That's what you call Roundup. It's kind of like, you know, Roundup's like Kleenex. You know, Kleenex is a brand name. It's facial tissue. But everybody calls it Kleenex. Somebody calls it Roundup. This is glyphosate's generic. Half the price of what you can buy in the store. Um, the other day, I was at Home Depot, and they had the name brand Roundup, Quart, Lawn and Garden Concentration, 18% active ingredient for $25.99. We sell the Remuda Quartz, full strength, 41% for $23.99. We're cheaper than the box stores. But it all depends on what you're doing. Monsanto professional Roundup people sold the lawn and garden side of the business to Scott's. Scott's own Scott's, Scott's own Will Grow, Scott's own Roundup. They make a cheap thing, advertise it a lot, charge you a lot of money for it. Um, but this is this is Roundup, generic Roundup. Prices on glyphosate have come down so much. You can go over there and buy a two and a half gallon of Razor Pro, 14% surfactant by weight for $79.99. Uh, they're, just, they're just cheap. It's called Remuda. This is called Remuda. What's in the other store? It's called Razor Pro. That's the professional side. 
There were a couple of questions people asked. I wanted you to ask me when we started back up. You had one of them. Can you mix the herbicides on your lawn? Okay, question. Can you mix herbicides on your lawn? Yes, you can. For instance, you can put down phenomethylene uh, with fertilizer without. You can also put down gallery at the same time. Two different active ingredients, no problem. You can put down herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, fertilizers, all at the same time, and not have a problem. Are there any active ingredients that should not be combined? The label will tell you if they're not. Generally, you have a problem with that. If you're, are there any labels or things that can't be combined? Generally, the granular products, there's no problem. The problem comes in mixing a tank to spray. There may be some incompatibility, and it'll tell you on the label, or it'll say mix two things together in a little jar and see if you have any problem with it. But generally, you know, they've pretty much taken the bugs out of things, so they'll tell you on the label. There was somebody else had a question about the soap. Yes, sir. Yeah, I had a burner tell me. Instead of the surfactant, mm-hmm. all you use was like Johnson's baby shampoo. Okay, the question is, if you don't have a surfactant and don't want to run to the store, uh, can I use soap? Yes and no. Sounds like you're running for office. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm covering myself here. Um, soap is a surfactant. It breaks down the cohesion of water. One of the reasons soaps will work is they're either negatively charged or positively charged. Remember the first part of the seminar, clay had a negative charge? If you use a soap that's a positive charge, that positive charge attracts to the negative. They combine. The soap will take that out of your clothes. That's the way it works. However, when you're dealing with a herbicide in, in suspension or in, in, a, in a shaker, sometimes that chemical interferes with the chemistry of what you're trying to spread. So in general... We suggest don't use soap because we don't know if it's cationic, which is positive, or anionic charge negative. We don't know what charge it is, and it could interfere with it. may not, but it could, the particular herbicide you're trying to put down. For instance, a Roundup molecule is negatively charged, and if I put a cationic surfactant in with it, the cationic and the anion, they're going to attract, and it's going to neutralize my Roundup. So a general situation is to be safe, use a non-ionic, unless the label specifically recalls for something else. But the answer is yes or no. It could help, but then it could also interfere with the work. Okay, any other questions from weeds? Pre-emergence, post-emergence, selective, non-selective, systemic contact. Okay. Insects, the creepy crawlies. These are little things that run around. Insects and damage plants. They suck the sap out of the plant, uh, cause it to look ugly, die. Um... General application of insecticides, how do they work? How do you kill an insect using an insecticide? Uh, most were, were work by blocking nerve transmissions. In other words, if you cause an insect to stop moving because it's paralyzed, it's eventually going to die. Um, whatever life function it has in it, it's going to stop, it's going to die. Some work by suffocation. You, you coat the insect or the egg with an oil. It, it blocks the breathing pores and it suffocates to death. Poor little bug. Anyway, one works by dehydrating insect. There's people uh, concerned about the environment, and uh, there's diatomaceous earth. It's not the same thing you do in a pool filter. It's processed differently. But the insect will walk across it, and it scratches its exoskeleton, and it causes it to dehydrate. And it doesn't suffocate, but it dries itself to death. So, anyway, some use outside, some use inside. You can check the label. But in general, there's there's three types of killers. I, I don't mean to sound hard or cruel. I'm just having fun. Um, you can work, block nerve transmissions. You can suffocate it or you can dehydrate it. There's two types of insecticides. Again, contact or systemic. Now, contact or systemic don't necessarily mean... The insect's going to come in contact with it, but it's also the delivery method. A systemic insecticide, you put it on the base of a plant, it goes up through the plant, and as the insect sucks or chews, it comes in contact with the material. A contact insecticide is one you just spray on the bush or the lawn. You can cover an insect existing. If it sprays on, the insect will die. It will remain on the plant for several weeks, and if an insect crawls across it, it's absorbed through the feet and then it will die. So the, the insect has to come in contact with the material, wherever it is, through through 
spraying on it or its feet or eating some part of the plant that has insecticide in it, it's going to die. It comes in contact with the material. Systemics, you have those that are put around the base of the plant. Somebody asked earlier, the Dexlaw was mentioning, does it have an insecticide with it? Yes, it does. It's an excellent insecticide. Put it around the base of the plant. It goes up through the plant. It lasts about four to six weeks. You get an aphid or a white fly come in, and it, it chews, it sucks, it dies. The thing with the systemics, it does not transfer from the plant to the bloom. So if you have an insect that feeds on the petals of the flower, you have to use something else. But in general, aphid or white fly or some of that that sucks or chews on the part of the plant. Control. You have systemic material. Um, generally, insects will be on the bottom of a leaf. You spray on top of the leaf. The insect's not controlled. It doesn't get come in contact with the material. But there are materials that are systemic in the sense they move from the top of the leaf to the bottom of the leaf. So you can spray on top of the leaf and the insect will come in contact with it because it moves through the leaf tissue. But generally, those are the types of uh, insecticides, contact system. Contact insecticide killed the insect by, con- by uh, suffocating as a contact or it's a nerve blocker. It comes in contact with the insect. You suffocate it by coming in contact with it. Uh, you come in contact with the insect by walking on it or eating it or spraying it on it. But still they do. The contacts, suffocants have no residual. In other words, it only kills what it covers. And then some comes back a day later, walks on top of it, it's just an oil, it's a spray oil. No no residual. Uh, the insect comes back in two, three days later, you need to spray again. There are benefits to that though. You kill the insect, next day or two a beneficial insect comes in like a ladybug or a lace wing, you're not going to kill it. Our advantages and disadvantages of these. Third blocker, contact, kill, spraying it, eating it, and has residual blandering through their feet. Systemic insecticides travel through the plant tissue and are nerve blockers absorbed from the ground, such as merit or disulfaton. That's the disulfaton is in the Dexol product. The merit is this right here. Merit is called imidacloprid. Uh, you can use this on a plant and get season-long control. The time to apply it for your plants is January. But once you put it on the ground, the label rate, the plant begins to absorb it. It moves six inches a day in the plant. So if you have a tree 15 feet tall, it's going to take 30 days to get to the top of that tree. So that's why you put it down in, in, in January, give it time to get into the tree before the insects would hatch out or come up. Uh, but that's merit, systemic Is material. Is that for fruit tree? This, no. This label does not cover that. However, Bayer has come out with a product containing merit that does say fruit, citrus, vegetable, insecticide. So merit is labeled in a different product for fruits, veggies. It's available in California. It's available in California. <laughs> this one? Uh, tree and shrub systemic insect killer. Just ask for merit and we'll know what it is. Hibiscus. Yes. Hibiscus. Now, what Bayer did, the after ingredients, 1.47%. What Bayer did is they lowered the percentage to 0.23%, got it labeled in California. You have to use approximately six times much material to get the same amount of merit. Somebody asked me the other day, this is cheaper. Yes. Same after ingredient. Yes. Can I use this? That's your call. Labels the law. This is what's labeled. Same after ingredient. Anyway. Yes. Yes. Okay, good question. The systemic action in merit, will it infect caterpillars? Yes and no. I ain't doing it again, aren't you? Okay, the reason I say that is because there is a distinction in caterpillars. There's the Lepidoptera and the Coleoptera. Lepidoptera, I, I, I'm getting it mixed up here, but one of them spends its adult life in the beetle stage. If it spends its adult life in the beetle stage, this will control it. If it spends its adult life, adult life as a moth or butterfly, this will not control it. For instance, merit will control grubs. 
caterpillar. It, it, it pupates, hatches out as the green beetle, June beetle, spends its adult life as a beetle. This will control it. This will control leaf miners. Yes. On a liquid amber, many people have problems with red hump caterpillar. Red hump caterpillar spends its adult life as a moth or butterfly. Will this control it? No. You have to use a different product. The other product over there, um, the instead of merit, it has dinotefuran in it. That does the caterpillars that spend their life in the adult stage. Just ask for the other stuff. But yeah, so you know, and this is part of the reason you guys are here and we're having the seminar, so you know what's what's going on. But this will control caterpillars that spend their life as a beetle. Yes, ma'am. Grape leaf skeletonizer yes. on your grape. Yeah. And so, I mean, I'd like to use a systemic, but I'm worried about, you know, it comes through the grapes, so why can't I do it? Because they, I, I tried putting, like, somebody told me to put soap. Okay, question is a little orange and black ring insect. That's a grape leaf skeletonizer. The only thing labeled for that is seven. It's a contact material. Seven, S-E-V-I-N. It's a liquid spray. You spray on there when you see the insect come out. You spray it. It's called the grape leaf skeletonizer. Okay, you can also use systemic insecticides. You can drill a hole in a tree trunk and plant that in a tree trunk. The sap flow takes it to that, the whole tree. Part it's called ace cap. Uh, season-long control. You can also spray them on top of the leaf, and it goes through the bottom, such as spinosad. spinosad. Spinal sad material, merit does also. Spray on top of the leaf, it will penetrate the leaf tissue to control insects inside the leaf. Leaf miners are an insect that tunnels inside the leaf, protected on top and bottom by the leaf tissue, tunnels inside the leaf, but you can spray it using a systemic material. You can do it on the foliage, which is called a foliar application, or you can do it in the soil, which would be a soil drench application. But either one of those will work. Okay, well, we're talking about insecticides. This is uh, neem oil, green light product called neem concentrate. Um, when organic materials first came out, everybody thought neem oil was the next best thing, and they had problems with it. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. So they went back to the drawing board and found out that not only neem oil is a suffocant, but there was an active ingredient in there that was actually a contact insecticide, a nerve blocker. It's called azadiractin. So what happened in the beginning was different neem oil people producers had different quad, different percentages of the active ingredient in it. And so you were getting spotty control. Now once they figured that out, neem oil has become a fairly good material as an insecticide. It's a suffocant as well as a nerve blocker. Neem will also control fungus and mites. A mite is a six-legged insect. It's actually not an insect, it's an arthropod. Insect, it's spider-like. Insect-like, it only has six legs. Insecticides will only control insects, they have eight legs. Mites have six, so most of your insecticides do not control mites. But this will as a suffocant oil as well as a nerve block. Certain kinds of insects. I know when I tried using oil, I mean, it's a baby short summer. It's just it's Okay, question though, there are certain times of the year you can use oils. Yes and no. <laughs> now the question is yes, it depends on the on the, the um depends on the type of oil it is. For instance, dormer oil sprays right now are not a very highly refined oil. They're fairly heavy. Uh, you can spray it on the tree, suffocates the eggs, but you don't want to use it in the middle of summer when you have foliage out. Uh, safety side. This is a suffocating oil, safety side. This is a highly refined paraffinic oil. You can spray this in Bakersfield in the middle of summer and not worry about leaf burn. So again, it depends on the type of oil it is. The neem oil label, uh, it will say when it's hot, Spray late evening. Uh, if you're concerned about sensitive plants, spray a little bit of one, see what kind of, if you get any damage or not. 
But in general, they're, sometimes they is safe, and other times it's not, depending on what type of oil product it is. I want to go back back to the pre-emergent, post-emergent for a second. One new thing we finally got in California this year is uh, Monterey has a product called Star Thistle Killer. Yes, we are outside. This is the material. It's labeled for broadleaf weed control in ranchette pastures. This will kill thistle. Best thing on the market to kill thistle, as well as other broadleaf weeds. There's no grazing restrictions with this material. So you can spray pastures that have grazing animals, and now we're done. So for somebody that has that kind of situation, there is a product, finally. As a selective post-emergent. Okay, let's see what else I got. Over here. Pardon? Yes, sir. On any of these type of materials, if you've used like a partial bottle and then you've closed it up and put it away, uh, what's the life expectancy of? Okay, question is what? Yeah, what's the life expectancy on a product once you've opened it? Generally, it'll be five years minimum, as long as it's kept from freezing, uh, normal temperatures. Uh, generally, five years. After that, I begin to question it. But generally, five-year shelf life should be fine. Okay. Okay, to control specific particular insects. Uh, ants do the two-step program. Controlling ants involves two steps. Number one, using a slow-acting bait. Um, one's called Amdro. It's an excellent bait. Grants has an excellent bait. It's a slow-acting poison. The worker ants forage for food. They bring this back to the nest. Uh, the colony, they feed it to the developing larva. They eat it. They regurgitate, and that's what's fed to the queen. But a slow-acting poison within 48 hours kills that entire colony. Now, the foraging ants don't eat it. They take it back to the nest. So the second step is 48 hours or two days later, you put out a contact material on top of the ground that then will kill the workers as they come in contact with it. But the oldest ants in the colony are those out hunting for food. They'll get the food, take it back to the colony. They'll go out and keep foraging. So kill the colony, first step. Second step, kill the ones on top of the ground. Abbott's Whitefly use systemics like Merit or the disulfaton in the Dexol product. You can use the contact material. Um, Bug Buster is an excellent contact material. Has been valorates the after ingredient. Uh, this will also control spiders as well as your insects. Uh, this has three, three different rates on it. One ounce per gallon to do plants. Two ounces per gallon to do routes outside your house, windows, eaves, garbage cans. A pint per gallon to do a perimeter treatment. So this is an excellent insecticide. What's that called again? Uh, bug buster. Bug buster. Bug buster. That's all the different ones I have out here. Okay, caterpillars use systemics. It's acephate or dinotefuran. There's your spelling, dinotefuran. Or contact materials like seven. Seven is an excellent caterpillar control. Uh, seven is also good for ticks and fleas. It's one of the best tick and flea killers. Uh, grubs is a systemic material is best. Um, ah, don't have one over here. Uh, any of our help back there? Yeah. Hey, Justin or David? Could you bring me a bag of that um, green light grub control with arena in it, please? The one we looked at last night. I'm going to come back to grub in a minute. Uh, fleas and ticks, contact like seven. Excellent. Um, granular versus spray. When killing insects in the lawn, we suggest a granular product versus spray. And the reason for that, a granular product has a release curve. Every time you water, some comes off. It's like water, bar, soap in a, in a tub. It keeps releasing. Uh, liquid will be gone in a couple weeks, but your granular product will have longer residual. Is that safe for dogs? Once it's watered in and dried, yes. Should you, should you only be applying this if you see, see this at a free margin type application? Too? Okay, the question is, should you apply it when you see them, or is it a pre-emergent, a preventative type thing? It can be either or. Generally, what we do out front is once a month I put down an insecticide and I'll rotate my active ingredients so that they don't build up resistance. 
Um, what bring it on up? <clears throat> Thank you. So it's best to, it just once a month is preventative. Rotate so you don't expose them to the same match ingredient each time. They're the lawn, flower bed, strawberries, trim. Okay, going back to grubs for a minute. Um, again, we talked earlier about the cost of registration, of bringing materials to market in any environment, whether it's the United States or California. The recent seminars I've been to, there's, there's the shift in the chemical industry is not to bring new products to market because they cost so much money. The shift is putting two prior materials together into one product or bringing professional markets to the homeowner level. They've done that this year with this product here. It's called Greenlight Grub Control with Arena. Arena is a systemic insecticide called clothinidin. Don't ask me to spell that one either. Clothinidin. It's been professionally available for years in a product called Arena, but not available on the homeowner market. It is now available in the homeowner market. Merit is an excellent grub control. Put down early season. As long as you use it early enough, it will kill the insect. Once the insect matures past a certain growth p position, it does not kill it. It just irritates it. This product will control it season long, regardless of what stage growth you're in. When do you put that down? In April, May, and last season long. So a nice thing about the new products, you're getting professional products that have been available on the professional side for years. Now they're being made available in the homeowner market. Rather than you know spending 150 to 250 million dollars on something new, they're just spending money to get these registered for the homeowner to use. So this is an excellent grub control. It's just available this year. It's brand new. Okay, indoors. Pardon. Yeah, it's lawn application. The nice about this, it also includes ground cover or shrubberries too. So lawn, flower beds, everywhere you go. Indoors, micro encapsulated products. Um, some of your insecticides will have an odor, not be very pleasant inside. Uh, Delta Methrin is a product that's micro encapsulated. What they do is they put a clay shell or a polymer coating around it, and you can use it indoors doesn't have an odor. It's not water soluble, so it doesn't wash away. But it still, as an insect, will come in contact with it. They can still absorb it through their feet and they'll die. A roach? A roach, an ant. Uh, well, the green light product is, uh, there's a couple of them over there. One's a dust, multi, many, many purpose dust. It's called Delta Methrin, is the active ingredient. A uh, little 24 ounce spray bottle gel. It's called roach, ant, and spider control, I believe. But they're microencapsulated. They have a four to eight month residual, which is excellent for indoor control. I like the dust. Uh, I've used the dust. I sprinkled it around the baseboard on, my, on the floor and then sweep it under the baseboard. A little gap under there. You sprinkle behind your couch in your living room. Your, you know your your things on the perimeter where you don't get at too much, and it's there for eight months. And, and we used to have a bad. Uh, on the south side of our house and living room, we had a bad box elder bug problem. Sprinkle that stuff down there and they just kind of gone away. So it's an excellent material, but microencapsulated means it's going to have a longer residual and you don't have the odor and it's not water soluble. What about cats? cats? No problem. They don't, they don't go for it. Concentrations are so low. Will it work on air weeks? Yes. Oh, Works on air weeks, yes. Yeah. One of our bathrooms had a problem with springtail one time. We got limited to that, just sprinkle around there, put it under the baseboard and Will it work on bug-on moths? <laughs> in, in, in high dose. In high dose. I didn't say that, yeah. <laughs> and what was that called again? Del Delta methrin is the active ingredient, but it's in a green light product called Many Purpose Dust or Antro and Spider Killer. Okay, yeah. okay, here's a trick. Uh, when you're dealing with insecticides, especially when you spray an insecticide, if you use an acidifier with it, you'll do a couple things. You will, on the bottom, increase the efficacy of the material, and you'll lengthen its residual. An acidifier is something that will lower the water pH of your spray tank. 
So if you take Baker's soda water, 8 pH, you put an insecticide in it, that insecticide is only active in the tank for a couple hours. It begins to break down. But if in that water tank you put in a water-soluble fertilizer, that's a great acidifier, water-soluble fertilizer, stir it up, now your pH is acid, 5.0, you put your insecticide in there, it can stay in your tank for up to 24 hours before it degrades. Or when you spray it out, it's going to last longer and have a greater efficacy when you spray it. So we suggest when you use a liquid insecticide to spray, um, use an acidifier. Kind of helps like surfactant helps the herbicide, the acidifier helps your insecticide. Okay, any question on insect control? We'll move to another insect control. Um, this is another new material this year. I went to a seminar last a year ago, in November. Uh, and then again last July at Santa Maria. I try to get over there in the summer. So one of the perks. Um, there are some new insecticides, what are called meta-active materials. They're classified by the EPA as reduced-risk insecticides. Active ingredient, this is called endoxicarb. You put this down on the ground, it's totally inert. You could eat it, kids could eat it, dogs can eat it, cats can eat it, nothing happens. An insect eat it, and as it digested, an enzyme that only insects have transforms this molecule into something that's toxic for the insect. Bang, it's gone. Is that like uh, similar to diazonon? No, diazonon is a contact nerve blocker material. Diazonon is, is active anytime. You can you could be affected by it, I can be affected by it any other. But this is totally inert in the environment. It only becomes active when it's metabolized by an insect. That's meta active labeling on it. So this is again a new thing available. It says fire ant killer. I talked to the rep here. Uh, he obviously can't, the label's the law, but he said there would probably be no reason this would not work on other ants as well. There is an attractant to the ants attracted there. So uh, that's a new thing this year too. Pardon? Oh, yeah. This is uh, Seven, you're all standby. Carbaryl is the active ingredient. Seven, uh, granular product. Last four weeks on the lawn. Put it down. Um, question two, can you mix things in your lawn? Yes, no problem. You can put down a fungicide. You can put down an insecticide. You can put down a pre-emergent. You can put down a post-emergent. You can put down a um, fertilizer. All at the same time. If they're granular. If they're granular. If you want to spray, you put the, you, you put the granular product first. Then you spray. And 24 hours later, you water them. It's so probably going to spray, say, Trimac or something like that. Uh, you wait 24 hours to water it in. But you can put, there's no problem with interaction of things. In fact, our front lawn, after they mow it, we're going to put down turf royal fertilizer, 005 pre emergent, baliton fungicide, and elite iron as a micronutrient. Four things we're going to put down after we get done. Okay. Fungi are the invisible killer. The majority of diseases are fungus diseases that attack plants. They're the most prevalent. They can attack lawns, ornamentals, and trees. How to control or prevent? Prevention is healthy plants. I mentioned earlier, sufficient amounts of potassium will have a thick cell wall. It's hard for the fungus to penetrate. Uh, it's just like you or I. If we stay healthy, we don't get colds. But the minute we get run down, you get stressed. Body immune levels drop down, you get a cold or you get sick. So keep your plants healthy. Weather conditions and what kind of pathogen or fungus you have. Uh, fungus are what are called opportunistic materials. So if somebody would come in today and say, I think I've got a fungus in my lawn, we would say, okay, cool nights, high humidity, it's probably this fungus. Springtime will say, warm days, cool nights, it's probably this fungus. Summertime, we'll say high daytime, high nighttime temperatures is probably this fungus. So we can't specifically tell which one it is, but you look at the weather conditions. Use the appropriate fungicide. Fungicides are best applied as a preventative. Uh, if you've had a fungus in the past on your lawn, your best thing to do is put it down now as a preventative. Uh, examples are Bacchanil, Baliton, Propiconazole, and Microbutanil. Some of these are for lawns, some of these are for flowers. Um, Baliton, Dacanil, Michael Butanil, those three can be on the lawn. 
dog or no, once it's watered and dried. Today, the bale ton. Right now. Yeah, pardon? It doesn't dry around here right now. <laughs> That's fine. Well, once, when you water them in, you're going to get them into the soil. What about if you have it right now? Which one will work? You know, there, on the bag, there will be a curative rate and a preventative rate. The curative rate is twice as high as the other one. You put it on every 7 to 14 days until it's gone. And we also suggest you use 7220 fertilizer with it because you want to encourage root growth because sometimes fungus will attack the roots. You want to encourage high potassium to get the plant back to good health. Dacanil is usually your uh, flower or shrub or tree diseases, but it can be in the lawn. Baleton is your lawn. Propiconazole, that's your uh, flower ornamental tree. And mycobutanol is your lawn. And again, you know, let us know your conditions or what you think you got. Bring in a sample and we'll take it from there. Um, again, funguses can be granular or they can be liquid. Uh, this is agrifos. This is infuse. Infuse is your propiconazole. This is baloton. Um, so it depends on where, where you're going to put it and what you're going to use it on. You have liquid or, or granular products. Molluscicides, things that control snails and slugs. Snails and slugs, not insects. They're a mollusk family. They're related to the barn of the barnacles. The barn of what do you call them? Barnacles. barnacles yeah, the mussels. So use a different material. Materials are metaldehyde, and metaldehyde a couple of years ago took a big increase in price, almost 50 percent increase in price. So they're kind of pricey. Iron phosphate, that's your pet safe material. Uh, the Monterey Sluggo. Got a picture of a pet rod on the front of it. So that's your pet safe material. A little more expensive, but they all need these things nowadays. They rain, rain fast. Rain doesn't bother them. Um, good control. Good residual. Talahide is usually only a problem. We had one problem with the homeowner said his dog ate his snail bait, called the vet, high amounts of vitamin K, saved the dog. But what he did is he had left the material in a bucket with no lid. And so the dog just came up and started eating and thought it was food. But, you know, generally if it's spread out on the ground, it's very hard for animals to get enough to do anything. But if it's concentrated in one spot. Um, you can take those and mix it with seven, which is a contact material. So now you have a snail killer with a, an insecticide. You get more control. Or you can take the iron phosphate and mix it with spinosad. Spinosad is a contact uh, insecticide. Uh, you get a greater control. You can control insects and slugs and snails with one material. So, in combining products together. Okay, any questions? Does the build up an immunity to this stuff real quick? Do the animals, the slugs? Yes. Usually the, the question is do, do insects or slugs build up an immunity? Generally, no. An insect can, the, the, the faster, how do I want to put this? The more life cycles an insect has in a year, the faster it can build up immunity. Because it has like five to seven life cycles a year, you use the same material over time, it can build an immunity. Cells and slugs, where maybe their life cycle is one year or two years, they don't have that same type of buildup to it. Because you don't have enough life cycles to have a, that, that chance of happening. There is some, uh, we've got some reports from people saying that merit, some insects are trying to build up a, uh, an uh, immunity to a merit. So that's something you need to look at if you use it. I would still use merit first. I'll use it on my own plants. I'll, I got it on my winter vegetable garden. Um, but if it gets to the point where I still have problems, then I'll switch to an active ingredient. But I would use that first. Life cycle, you mean that it can, it can reproduce seven times? Yeah. Yeah, they, they can mate, lay eggs, become adult, mate, lay eggs, become adult, yeah, seven times, five to seven times in a year. Then you might have some problem with, with buildup. Good, good, good clarification. Okay, rodenticides, things that control rodents. What kind of rodents can we have in a lawn landscape area? Gophers, moles, mice, rats. Possums, big rodent. <laughs> okay, a gopher most effective way to control is probe and bait. There are three different ways to control gophers. Gassers, a trap, or a probe and bait. A probe and bait is your most effective, least evasive, invasive way. You don't have to dig a hole to put a trap down. But it is a little more expensive because you have to buy a piece of equipment. 
but that's the best way to do it. Anybody who does rodent control for a living, go for control, we'll use a probe and a bait. Uh, rats use traps or baits. Baits are an attractant with a material that they eat and ingest. It's mostly difacinone. Um, the way they die is they eat enough of that stuff and it's an internal bleeding, causes them to bleed to death internally and then they, they die. They bleed to death internally, they die, they desiccate, which means they dry up. So if you have mice in your attic, you put out some bait, the rat or mouse dies, you don't smell it. It doesn't just die and rot. It desiccates, dries up, it doesn't have an odor to it. Um, Gopher control is a strychnine base. It's a single feeding, does kill them. People worry about secondary kill. In other words, gopher dies in the ground, the dog digs up the gopher, the dog eats it. Can the dog be affected? Well, it could be. But generally, dogs that are big enough to dig in the ground need a gopher are so much bigger that that little material is not going to hurt anything. But there is a dead, dangerous secondary kill. That's why you use them in the ground. The gophers die in the ground. Don't worry about it. Uh, ground squirrels, you have gassers, traps, and or baits. Traps are pretty, are a uh, repeating trap. I've used a repeating trap myself where we lived a couple years ago. Our neighbor has 10 acres, we have 10. We were infested with ground squirrels. My wife and I declared war on the terrorists. And uh, it took us all summer and about $3,000, but we got rid of them. We used, from Caddyshack. <laughs> so what'd you do? I, we used the gassers. Uh, my wife and this was a togetherness project. She and I went out together, spending quality time with your family. Um, it's it's a it's a little uh, thing you put a fuse in. You light the fuse, drop it down the hole, and then you come with a piece of cardboard and you shovel dirt over the cardboard to keep the gas inside it. And that thing fumes in there. The the ground squirrels inhale it. They die. They're buried. Uh, there's no no harm of secondary kill or anything. It does an excellent job. Two, three, four weeks later, we be out. We see a ground squirrel running around out there. Oh man! So we go out and investigate. Never was our original cardboard dirt disturbed. There will be a little hole like this, two to three feet away from that original hole. And what it is is they hibernate. Uh, at any one time, thirty percent of your ground squirrel community is hibernating. I fear hibernation meaning went over the corner and was sleeping a deep sleep. But that's what they do. They actually burrow and seal themselves off from the rest of the area. So we put the gassers down there; it wouldn't control them. The guys would come up. So we could either walk out there, they go down the hole, put another gasser down there, or we would take the bait. The bait is difacinone. Sprinkle around there. You have to feed them for three days. They have to have food for three days. And they eat enough of the material to die. So we gassed the whole 20 acres, and then wherever they came up, we put the bait out, and we never had another problem since. Traps, repeating trap, it's a square like this by Yay High. Um, you pre bait, which means you put something out that the ground squirrels are attracted to potato chips, pretzels, bird seed. Uh, you get them used to feeding it, and then you put a big pile of it, set this trap right in the middle of it. Uh, they come into the trap to get the food. There's a little door that goes up and comes back down. They can't get out. What do you do with it after that? Well, there's several things you can do. You have to dispose of a live animal. We don't suggest shooting it because of the blood on the trap. you got to clean it and everything like that. You, What we did, we have a fish pond. Drowned them. I know, poor heart is cruel me, huh? But what my problem was... I didn't secure the top latch enough, and so they got out. And here I'm running across my yard trying to catch these half-drowned ground squirrels. My dog tried to get one, and the ground squirrel tore the dog. No, not tore, but the dog learned not to mess with the ground squirrel. But but you can trap. We have pictures of up to 14 ground squirrels in one trap. So, you know, that's the cheapest way to do it. It's the least amount of labor involved. You pre-bait it, put the trap down there. You know, you're not out throwing cartridges in the ground. You're not out there putting bait. But anyway, it, it's it's a method. Yes, question? Yes, sir. I've got something that's eating out the inside of my oranges in the orange tree. I, I put it out rats. Yeah, you got something eating the inside of the oranges. Probably rats. Um, there is over there. We sell a tom block bait that's got a hole in it. And that hole is there. You use that hole to wire that bait in your tree. Put blocks it in the tree, and then the, the rat will start going those and gnawing those, and then they'll get them. Different active ingredient in that. I think it's called uh, bromethylene or something like that, bromethylene. 
But again, it's a it's an internal bleeder, internal bleed death kind of thing. Is that next to the pelican? That's next to the pelican. Yep, next to the pelican. A Twenty-two, and I got a two twenty-three for the coyotes too. Twenty-two just wasn't big enough. Yes, sir. Uh, at the base, as far as a pet standpoint, how harmful? Again, this is uh, a couple cautions. You are putting this on top of the ground. The particular material is called PCQ. It actually has twice as much active ingredient as the uh, mouse and rat stuff. Um, you want to use it away from where pets and animals get because it is on top of the ground. Uh, again, you have a little ground squirrel, bigger dog, Eat much, yeah, but it's as possible. So it's a precautionary on that one, yes. Okay, that's how I take it. Uh, by the way, ground squirrels are very social animals. You'll see a bunch of them together. Ground, uh, gophers are solitary. Each gopher will occupy 1,000 to 1,500 square feet. So if you have one over here and one over here and one over here, you probably have three different ones. Or if there's a bunch of mounds there, you only have one. So they're, they're solitary animals. I've come home some nights and seen them crawling across my driveway. They're nocturnal animals. You get out and kill them right away. Uh, at a certain point, the mother will kick the babies out and they go find some place to. But they're they're solitary animals. They won't shoot me. But, okay, I think that does it. Rodents. Application equipment. Okay, we're nearing the end of the seminar. I appreciate your patience. Appreciate their hanging in with me uh, just a little bit longer. Anybody have any questions over what we've looked at so far? Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Moving up through the plant, but when it comes to the flower portion, right? Not the flower. That's correct. I have a problem every year with turf weevils in my uh, bearded iris. Okay. And the old reliable dirt bed isn't available anymore. Right. What do I use? I would use the question is uh, the systemic materials that you put in the ground to come up plant did not migrate to the flower. So what do you use? Uh, Dursban is no longer available. The best for that was also a product called Thiodan. It's been taken off the market as well. Uh, I would use the Bug Buster. Okay. That's the next best thing. You got Bug Busters. And one ounce per gallon should do that. Okay, any other questions? Okay, now you got all this information. You got pre emergence, post emergence, insectified, fungicides, ready to go out and do it. How do we do it? Well, you have to have some kind of application equipment. If you use a liquid, you're going to use a sprayer. If you have a granular product, we're going to use some kind of spreader. So let's take a look at sprayers first. A sprayer, there's, there's several different types of sprayers. You can have a hose-in sprayer, and there's two types. There they are. Okay, there's two types of hose-in sprayers. This one is called an adjustable or dial rate. You put straight material in there. The label will tell you how much dilution and you set the dial up here, you hook it up your hose, you spray away. That water shooting through here creates a suction, a venturi suction that draws the material up. Based on the size of that opening, it varies the amount of material up through here. So ideally, if you set this at one ounce per gallon, as the water goes through there, it's mixing it at one ounce per gallon. You spray away, spray away, spray away, turn it off. When it's all done, you take this out, pour this back into your container, rinse this out, put it on the shelf. Dial a rate. These are good for insecticides and fungicides. Yeah, it'll, it'll suck the material down here as it goes down when it sucks it dry, but it'll tell you on the label an ounce per gallon or something like that. Water does not go in. Water is not good. Now this one here, this is a fixed rate sprayer. A uh, fixed rate sprayer does not have a dial on top, and it'll give you a number on it. 6, 8, 20, 25, something like that. A fixed rate sprayer, you have to know the amount of material you put both material and water inside it. So let's say you've got something that mixes at an ounce per gallon. This is a 6 gallon sprayer. I need 6 ounces of material. So right here, I put in 6 ounces of material. I want six gallons of spray. Over here it says fill to the top for six gallons. So I put my water up to here. Shake it up, hook it up. I spray it out. Again, this will suck this dry. But I put six 
gallons of water out, six ounces of material. Um, these again are used good for insecticides, fungicides. I do not like to use these for pre-emergence because I can't get uniform coverage on the ground with them. But insecticides, fungicides, it's good to use them. But the fixed rate, dialer rate, know how to use each one. Um, you have compression sprayers. There are two types, handheld and backpack. The way the compression sprayer works, compression sprayers work. Say you're getting a product, one ounce per gallon. This is a two-gallon sprayer. I want to use two gallons. I fill it up halfway, put two ounces of material in it, agitate it, fill it up the rest of the way, agitate it, put the lid on, and then I pump it up. Compressed air in the top forces the liquid out through the tube and your sprayer. Compressed air, compressed sprayer. A backpack will do the same thing, only it's designed to be put on your back and hold more water. My house, uh, we got 10 acres of land, eight and a half, eight and three quarters of the irrigated farmland, an acre and a quarter for the house outbuildings and stuff. I have a four gallon backpack and a two gallon handheld sprayer and one dialer rate sprayer. Can you mention how much you have to rinse out if you change from one material to another? How much, how much do you have to rinse out? Do I have to have a sprayer for everything? No, you don't have to have a sprayer for everything. Some people do. But generally, if you're done with this, you triple rinse the tank and then run clear water through your hose and you're fine. These come in one gallon, two gallon, three gallons. Uh, backpacks, well, one and two gallon for these. Backpacks are three, four, and five and a half gallon. The only five and a half gallon backpack I saw was a guy smaller than Bonnie here. A lot of water. My wife uses a four gallon, but she only puts two gallons of water in it. You don't have to fill it up all the way to use it. It's so the weight issue. Um, but compressed, different quality. Uh, you pay for what you get. Uh, we have good, better, best, and professional quality. Um, the Jack Doe sprayer, that's the one I have myself. It's an excellent sprayer. You can also have pump, electric, or gas engine. Some people have a lot of area, uh, maybe a couple acre place, and they've got a little 12 or 25, 14 gallon tank. It's got electric pump on it. You know, put it on your quad, the trailer. Yeah. So you can have a use the electric and hook it up to a car battery, 12 volt battery, and you got a pump and a sprayer. Same thing. You mix up how many you want, it sprays out. Proper calibration is key to effectiveness. In your handout, you've got a little, in your packet, you've got a little handout that talks about how to calibrate your sprayers. Some people come in and say, well, I sprayed Trimec on my lawn and it didn't kill the weeds. Well, what kind of weeds are you trying to spray? Oh, dandelion, clover, okay, Trimec's designed to do that. How did you mix it? I put four ounces in a gallon of water, okay. Um, did you spray that on a thousand square feet? I don't know. Calibration of sprayer is key that you need to put four ounces of material on a thousand square feet. One of these is starting to run out. I can hear it whistling. Does that bother you? We'll shut it off. Okay. I want the heat. You want the heat. Okay. Is that going to cause a problem on the, on the tape back there, that, that whistling, whining? Okay. No idea. Um, where were we? Calibration. Okay, calibration is key. Uh, we suggest is fill your tank with clear water, mark off a thousand square foot air on your lawn, put cans, something I use, uh, pinto bean cans from my pantry. I spray that area like I normally spray, and I see how much water I actually used. People use anywhere from a half a gallon to a gallon and a half to cover a thousand square feet. If you use a half a gallon to cover a thousand square feet, and you put four ounces per gallon, you're actually doing 2,000 square feet with four ounces. You're only putting two ounces per thousand, which means you're not going to get the control you want. So calibrate your sprayer, key to, key to success. Spreaders, handheld. I have a question. Yes, sir. Question. Uh, the sprayers have different tips. Yes. I guess for spray pattern. Okay. Question is sprayers have different tips for spray pattern. There is there's adjustable cone nozzle ones, that's kind of a hollow cone that goes out or a stream. And then there's your flat fan tips. Generally we suggest for herbicide application a flat fan tip. 
And most labels will say, use a flat fan tip when you spray herbicide, post-emergent herbicides. Pre-emergence, insecticides, you may want the hollow cone so you can get in different things here and, and you know, shoot a stream if you need it. But for, for general application on non-open areas, it's flat fan tip. Okay, there's uh, broadcast spreaders, drop spreaders. Broadcast spreaders, drop it down, the material throws out. There's a thing in your hand that I'm using these things too. Notice only one wheel is a drive wheel. So, key as to a use, if you are going along like this and you start to turn, you don't want to do that. There's only one wheel drive. Go to the end, stop, move around, and keep going again. With a broadcast spreader, you overlap. You overlap a third. When you use this, you're going down like this, you see how far it throws out? It throws out six feet. You want two feet overlap, so you go down, you move over four feet, come back the other way. If you move over too far, you get uneven application. If you don't move over enough, you're over applying material. You drop spreader. Again, the same thing is true. Every one of these wheels is a drive wheel. They never want to turn corners. Go straight, stop, turn around, come back. We have some of our help out front one day. Go like this, turn. What was he doing all the time he turned? He dropped the tree. Now they come back the other way. Now I'm not dropping anything. So, clean stables are nice, but much increase comes by the yacht. So, we hire part timers and clean up messes. <laughs> But uh, so a key to using those is the one drive wheel, one's not. Difference between drop and broadcast. Drops are more accurate, broadcasts are faster. Most of your commercial applicators will have a drop to go around the edges, and they'll use a broadcast down the middle. Yes, sir? I have one of the handheld spreaders, uh -huh. and that uh, it didn't work real effectively. I uh, didn't jam it up, yeah. and uh, you know, I have the long to prove it too. Right. Is it Scotch, again, if I could find a different thing, I can find it. Scotch used to have a material, the plate came off, had screws down here. They came up with a process where the machine will do this. These are junk, but it's all there is. Scotts will make so much money selling the fertilizer, they can sell their spreaders at cost. I go to the National Hardware Show in May in Las Vegas every year. I go to trade shows. I go to there. There, Nobody has a spreader that can compete with Scott's. There are spreaders out there. We hear the Earthway brand. But nobody can, can compete with Scott's on the homeowner market level because they sell them at cost. We've tried taking more of these back in the last year than we ever did before when they changed the design. But there's nothing else out there. But it is a good question. Again, how to use these? Throw them against your uh, driveway. Throw them against your driveway? Okay. Uh, a handheld, somebody say, what's the setting on here? There's one to five. Basically, for the materials you would use, pre-emergence, insecticide, there is no setting. The only way to accurately use a handheld is to know the area you're going to cover, know how much money, how much coverage area covers the bag does, and then just continue to go over and over the area until you've applied a proportional amount of material. Wouldn't you have to use that in farming? You can. Right. Or you can broadcast with the flower bed. Yeah, you can use these flower beds. Again, the idea, i got a 1,000 square foot of flower bed. This bag does 4,000 square feet. I just keep going around and around until I put a fourth of the bag down. I think you can, once these are done, wash them out, take your hose, whether that will help keep things clean. But, again, um, these cost, I think, $12.99. The 99, There's an Earthway over there. It's a red one. It's not as pretty, but I think it's going to work better. It's a little more expensive. Um, okay, any questions? 